In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. Forgive me. So my dear ones, in the church today, yes, we are celebrating this glorious marriage of Joseph and Laura. But we are also in the Sunday after the commemoration of the holy and life-giving cross. And for those of you who do not know, right near the door, you will see flowers there, and you will see the cross on the flowers. Around that cross is a pendant, and in that pendant is a small little sliver of the true cross that St. Helena found. So when you, when you look at that cross as you go out, that is a piece of the true cross 2,000 years old in that over there. And so we celebrate the cross. And as we heard from St. Mark's Gospel, that if we wish to be a follower of Christ, we must take up our cross and follow. St. Matthew in his Gospel from the seventh chapter says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There is no other way to be a follower of Jesus Christ than to follow him on the road of the cross. And this narrow road is paved with stones, and these are its stones. That we love God with our heart and soul and mind and strength. That we love others more than ourselves. That we give expecting nothing in return. That we turn the other cheek. That we give to the poor. Be willing to die for the sake of the gospel and the life of another. To love our enemies. To pray without ceasing. To be peacemakers to rejoice with those who rejoice to weep with those who weep to lift up the oppressed to love justice to show mercy to be humble to control the tongue to put on the mind of Christ to nurture and love silence to love without condition to become pure in mind and heart, and to do everything necessary to think and to live in the way that pleases God. You can see why this path is narrow and only chosen by a few. And not all who find it want to follow it, and many do not even care to try. Because we are not following a political ideology. In the very last verse of the gospel, it says this, Verily I say to you, that there may be some here that stand which shall not taste of death until they have seen the kingdom of God come with his power. And these words, by the way, are addressed to us. And so what do they mean? What does it mean to taste death? And what is it to see the kingdom of God? To taste death means to suffer from all that has entered into this world when death entered into this world. For when Adam and Eve fell, not only did death enter into the world, but also hard work, the pain of childbirth, anguish, depression, stress, worry, disease, and old age. And all of these things are what it means to taste death. And every time we undergo them, we suffer a part of death, and we get a foretaste of it. So then, what does it mean to overcome them? How can we actually avoid the taste of death? And the answer to this can only be that we have to return to Eden. For in Adam and Eve's fall, we have fallen. We have fallen through Adam and Eve and have tasted the death 
through the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And today's service tells us that we can be restored to the state of mankind before the fall only by tasting the fruit of the new tree of life, and that is the cross. The new Adam is Christ. The new tree is the cross. The fruit is the resurrection. The new Eden is the church and the resurrected body of Christ. And we taste of that fruit of the resurrection when we partake of the Eucharist in the liturgy. And this is precisely the meaning of the gospel today, to see the kingdom of God come in power. In other words, if we face up to life's difficulties with the cross of Christ, we shall not taste the bitter death. Those difficulties that we have in our life no longer hold sway over us. And it is the whole difference, by the way, between how the church accepts the cross and how the world rejects it. The world sees all of human problems in anguish, for the world is locked into pessimism. It sees no way out of its difficulties, for it does not have an eternal perspective. It does not have the perspective of the cross. On the other hand, the church sees all of the difficulties which come to us naturally as challenges and opportunities to combat evil, temporary difficulties. However long those difficulties actually end up being, the worst thing that happens to us is that we die. And for the Christian, to die is to be with Christ and no longer holds the sting. For Christ has overcome death in the light of the cross and its fruit, the resurrection. Death holds no fear for us. The taste of death becomes the taste of life. The cross and the resurrection bring life more abundantly. In the light of the cross and the resurrection, we see the kingdom of God where there is no sickness, sorrow, or sign, but only life everlasting. When we walk the narrow path that leads to life and we look at our lives from this Christian perspective, then indeed we do not taste death, for we have already started to see and taste and live the kingdom of God. This next part that I want to talk about is actually for the newly married couple. Previously, I talked about the narrow road that we must walk that leads to Christ. And so now I'm going to reread these to you, but I want you to think to them in your marriage. Love God with your heart and your soul and your mind and all your strength. Love others more than yourself, meaning you must love your spouse more than yourself. Ex give and expect nothing in return. Learn to turn the other cheek. Give to the poor. Be willing to die for your spouse and for the gospel. Love your enemies, because in the flash of a moment, Every once in a while, our spouse can become our enemy. Pray without ceasing. Be peacemakers. Rejoice with your spouse. Weep with your spouse. Lift up your spouse. Love justice. Show mercy. Be humble. Control the tongue. Put on the mind of Christ. Repent of everything that is not his mind. Nurture and love silence. My dear ones, we love to fill up our lives with noise. And in our marriages, it's also good to have a little quiet. Love without condition. Become pure in mind and in heart. And do everything necessary in your marriage to live the way that is pleasing to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Thank you.